good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to the release of our new report entitled The Future Fighter Force Our Nation Requires, Building a Bridge. As many of you are aware, the U.S. Air Force Fighter Force is in crisis. After three decades of canceled, curtailed, and delayed investment in fighter aircraft modernization, the nation now finds itself with a fighter force half the size of that which fought in Desert Storm over 30 years ago, and over three times older today, with an average age approaching 30 years. Uh, the Commander of Air Combat Command, General Kelly, did a great job briefing these facts at the Air, Space, and Cyber Conference last month. He also made the point that this isn't just an issue for the Air Force, as no major joint force operations are viable without control of the air. Ships at sea, forces on the ground, space control centers, cyber facilities, logistics hubs, and more are simply not survivable when subject to high intensity air attacks. Now, after over 30 years of receiving less annual funding than both the departments of the Navy and the Army, and by the way, a trillion dollars less than the Army since 9-11, the Air Force is in quite a predicament. It drastically needs to recapitalize with fighters relevant for the peer fights of the future. And while it's doing the best that it can, given the fewest resources relative to the other departments allocated to the Air Force, um, what we've got today is Heather Penny, a senior fellow here at the Mitchell Institute, who's gonna offer some innovative ideas that the Air Force will certainly benefit from considering. So after she explains her analysis and conclusions, we're really fortunate to be joined by General Mike Lowe, former Air Force Vice Chief of Staff and Commander, Air Combat Command, as well as John Venerable, Senior Research Fellow for air and space issues at the Heritage Foundation, uh, both of whom will be in, engaging us and Heather in a discussion. So welcome to you all and thanks for joining us. And uh, with that, let's begin with a summary of the project. And uh, as Heather's getting ready to give her presentation, I just wanna remind you all in the audience, feel free to raise your hand using the function on the app or submit a question in the Q&A window anytime during the discussion. And we'll get to those questions in the second half of the hour. So with that, over to you, Heather. Very good. Thank you, sir. Um, so this briefing is fundamentally about how to mitigate risk over the next decade. That's why we call it a bridge, to get across the chasm of capability and capacity in the fighter force. Can we please bring the slides up? Thank you. Slide. So as General Deptula said, air power is the foundation of joint power. If we don't control the sky, none of the other services capabilities can be employed to their fullest potential, if at all. So again, whether it is a satellite ground station, a warehouse full of cloud servers, ships at sea, a column of tanks or a platoon of infantry, if we don't have air dominance, the investments we make in any other military capability is suboptimized. But the Air Force's fighter force is too old and too small. But we've heard this for a long time. So much so that it probably sounds a little like the boy who cried wolf. You know, after all, we still have senior leaders say we're the best Air Force in the world. And after 20 years of operations in the Middle East, air power still has not let our nation down. But we are too small, small and too old because the Air Force has not been appropriately resourced for over 30 years. And that's why the Air Force is in the position of having deferred recapitalization for yet another decade. We at Mitchell are very concerned about this because jets are at the breaking point. And this ne next decade is not going to be one where we can afford to take this risk. So we need a bridge to get from where we're at now to the future force of the Air Force envisions. Slide. So this graph shows how we got here. You can clearly see across the entire history of the Air Force from 1950 uh, to today, the increased spending of the Reagan years there in the 1980s, right? But note that the inventory doesn't really grow. What Reagan did was turn over the fleet. He replaced third generation aircraft with fourth generation aircraft. 
And for the most part, this was not a period of invention, but a period of transformation because of that replacement. We're still living off those investments today. The 1990s is the decade of the peace dividend and the procurement holiday. So you can see the budget dropped precipitously and the Air Force inventory, as General Dipfula said, was cut in half. For fighters, that was from, went from over 4,000 fighters to about 2,000, which we still have today, although we've also still gotten smaller. Note, however, that the 1990s was still a really busy decade for the Air Force. We were conducting operations Northern Watch and Southern Watch, as well as engaging in contingencies like Bosnia and Kosovo. So the last 20 years of the long war have further hollowed out the force. Very few aircraft were procured. And in fact, the Air Force continued to divest fighters. Remember uh, CAF Redux? But operations did not slow down. And with high ops tempos and small fleets, both jets and air crews, air crews have been worn out. Build. So this next graph tells a similar story, but just in a different way. We still have the budget line, which is blue budget, right? That's that, that blue line. Uh, but then we also have the uh, orange line of fighter deliveries. You can clearly see the bump here in the 1950s for the early jets and the Century Series fighters. You see the next bump of fighter deliveries of third generation aircraft like the F-4 and F-111. And then in the 1980s, you see another bump of the Reagan era defense spending that replaces most of those earlier generations. But note, there's no follow on bump. Despite the F-22 and the F-35, there's been no fifth generation recapitalization. Bill. So Gates terminated the F-22 with few operational or politi political consequences. But because he prematurely terminated the F-22, F-15Cs are still in service. What should have been another major fleet turnover simply has not happened. Defense leaders were comfortable taking those risks because they didn't believe that the threats were credible and that they didn't believe those threats were urgent or imminent. Turns out that was a bad bet. Slide. So the Air Force has been put into a no-win situation. They're in a square corner, not of their own making. You can see the quote here by General Brown that the budget pressures are immense and there the budget is what's driving these dire courses of action. A major issue is that the only account that the Air Force has any real flexibility in which to do these trade-offs is procurement. That's why they're basically cannibalizing their fleet to fund their future 2030s requirements. The Department of the Air Force has had the lowest top line of any services. When I say lowest top line, what I mean is the Air Force's blue budget, after you take away pass-through, has been the lowest of any services, as General Deptula said. And yet, the Air Force still has the Space Force as an unfunded mandate. They have to maintain readiness. They have to maintain operations. They can't neglect non-negotiables like the two legs of the nuclear triad, and they cannot touch personnel in those associated accounts. So the Air Force's last and only choice is, is, for trade-offs is procurement and that force mix force structure. That's why we're seeing the Air Force shrink their force and bring their buys down over at least the next five years, if not longer. So you see the Air Force's plan on the left-hand side of the slide, but bottom line, the Air Force is being forced to shrink rather than grow over the next 20 year, or next 10 years in the course of the 2020s. This is the real defining feature of the Air Force's plan, the divestment of an aircraft at a greater rate than procurement. From an operational perspective, this is the real risk. It's also a major gamble from a force structure perspective because the Air Force is hoping to be able to apply the savings that they get from the divestments towards procurement in future out years. And again, if anyone remembers CAF Redux, that's a cautionary tale. In 2009, the Air Force retired approximately 250 legacy fighters in the hopes that they could take that savings and then apply it to future fifth generation buys. And that never happened. Deferring this kind of recapitalization is also problematic because of the nature of the 2030s. Other programs will also be vying for production in that decade. GBSD, B-21, MH-139, the T-7, NGAD, ABMS, KC-46, and more. Ironically, as difficult as this decade will be, the window to buy is now. Slide. So I've got this tale here just as a reminder to, that even in 1991 during Desert Storm and as capable as fourth generation fighters were, they were still vulnerable to enemy air defenses. And remember, General Goldfein got shot down during Allied force less than 10 years later. Air defenses are only becoming more advanced, making these legacy aircraft more vulnerable. Build. 
the need for fifth generation and advanced fighters isn't just for pure conflict anymore. So what happened recently in Syria should be a real cause for concern. Russia sends some SU-57 SU fighters and S-400s, and we suddenly had to send forward our fifth generation aircraft because our entire legacy fleet was now irrelevant and highly vulnerable against those threats. Gapping the force means that we risk encouraging the very behavior we wish to deter, build, if adversaries know that we will not act because we do not have the force to do so, they may be emboldened to take advantage of the opportunity. Build. I mean, just think about Putin in the Ukraine. Not having a strong force increases global instability because opportunistic actors will take advantage of power vacuums. And this is what we're seeing in the South China Sea and across the Taiwan Straits right now. We have to have a fighter force that's credible both in capability and capacity, build. And specifically, when it comes to China's global aspirations, we cannot wait until the 2030s. Their period for opportunism in the, is in this decade. We can't defer the recapitalization any longer. The quote here in the bottom of the slide, I think, is really poignant. Nothing we might theoretically achieve in 2035 and beyond is worth pursuing at the expense of China credible capabilities that we can realistically achieve no later than the mid to late 2020s. Slide. So this is our first recommendation for the Air Force to develop a planning force to educate the Department of Defense and Congress about the risk that our nation is taking. A planning force is the force, capabilities, capacity, mix needed to fulfill the national defense strategy. Now the Air Force stopped developing planning forces in the late 1990s. The 386 Air Force We Need, developed under Secretary Wilson a couple of years ago, is the closest thing we have today to a planning force. And that was only done because Congress directed the Air Force to do so. The programmed force is what the service can afford. It's what it's budgeted to do. And the difference between the planning force and a program force is the risk our nation is taking. But you have to know what the planning force is if you want to make smart decisions about the resourcing about the budget and the program force and understand the risk that you're assuming. Some of the important considerations when building a, a planning force is first, it must account for attrition in ways we haven't thought about in over 30 years. There's no longer any such thing as immaculate warfare. Second, we'll have to plan for duration. That means we have to plan for more attrition reserve than we've had in the past and to fight wars that are last longer than two, three, or even four weeks. Third, the tyranny of distance will also drive more forces. We will be required to have more capacity because maintaining tempo and mass across that range means we have to be able to continue to feed the fight. Fourth, while standoff is an important and a complementary capability, penetration will be crucial to operational cost effectiveness. Standoff is prohibitively expect expensive with the number of targets and across any kind of prolonged conflict. And finally, as important as information and battle networks will be to our future operational concepts, ABMS and JADC2 doesn't decrease your force size. These battle networks will make us more resilient, but they cannot make up for capacity. Just think about the Battle of Britain. The radars and networks were important, but none of that information mattered if Britain didn't have enough Spitfires and Hurricanes to close the deal. So as the department evaluates our fighter force, not all fighters are equal. Other services fighters have specific and dedicated service responsibilities. For example, Navy fighters are supposed to protect the carrier group and conduct limited strike in support of the group's tasking. And Marine Corps fighters' primary mission is to support Marine infantry with close air support. Furthermore, Navy and Marine Corps fighters operate on a tiered readiness construct. They spin up for their carrier deployment and they simply don't have the same deployability as Air Force fighters, because once they come back, they then fall off the cliff as the carrier goes in for repairs and maintenance. So when evaluating fighter forces across the Department of Defense, we cannot treat them as the same. The numbers simply aren't interchangeable. Slide. So how to read the remainder of these slides is, on the top, you see the, the Air Force's plan. On the text, we have our analysis. And in the bottom is our recommendation. 
So when it comes to the Air Force's legacy plan, the Air Force is right that it needs to leverage its legacy fleet to preserve capacity. But instead of simply downsizing the A-10 and F-16 fleets, we recommend that the Air Force retire whole fleets. But how it does so is important because the service still has to retain capacity and not simply just capacity of numbers of fighters, but enterprise capacity. And that means things like bases, depot, pilot training, maintenance training, and so forth. Replacing whole types at a one-for-one -one rate. So as soon as you see one jet leave the ramp, you see its replacement coming in within the same year. So there's no gap in the capacity. That's also the best and most pragmatic way of doing this. So the service should focus on retiring one type entirely and then moving to another because the high fixed costs of piecemealing these divestments is unsustainable. It's similar to maintaining a bridge mortgage on your house where you move into the new house, but you're still paying for the old one that you're not using because the cost to sustain these aged aircraft and the enterprise is high, but we can't afford to gap the capacity in either. So the best way to minimize this burden is to aggressively replace whole aircraft inventories at this one-for-one -one rate to avoid gapping combat capacity or frankly, Air Force bases, units, and that supporting enterprise. Slide. The Air Force is also right in looking to retain F-22 as a bridge to NGAD because air dominance is the core foundation to all US military air power. As such, we must continue to modernize the F-22, which may mean that we no longer subscribe to the sundown concept where you stop modernization five years towards your planned investment. Because the fact of the matter is, we don't really know when we will be able to operationally or strategically afford to divest the F-22. Because we caution that the Air Force should consider that NGAD will take time to mature. And not, and not just about reaching capacity. Because remember, the F-35 first started hitting Air Force ramps over 10 years ago, but it was a baseline capability, and it didn't reach operational capability until years afterwards. So the F-22 will have to be retained beyond the first uh, units of production for NGAD, and potentially even beyond initial operating capability. We should expect that NGAD will be similar to that F-35 fielding construct and that F-22 isn't just the bridge when the first NGAD rolls off the line. And this may mean the F-22 is retained well into the 2030s and only retired when it becomes excess capacity to the air dominance planning force. Slide. The reality is there's no better choice for the Air Force to bridge to the 2030s and mitigate risk over the next decade than to aggressively ramp F-35 in this decade we have to begin buying F-35 now because it's the only fifth generation fighter in production today. Deferring that full rate to the 2030s also doesn't make sense from that budget standpoint because as I mentioned, there are so many programs that will be vying for those procurement dollars. We understand that the Air Force wants to wait until Block 4 rolls off the line in production, but that doesn't make sense because you can't simply turn the spigot of aircraft production on it takes time to build that industrial capability. Every F-35 bought in the F-24 uh, budget, it will have the foundation for those Block 4 capabilities. And F-30, every F-35 the Air Force doesn't buy now is a future Block 4 that they won't have in the 2030s. Finally, when it comes to F-35, we have to talk about the elephant in the room, the Joint Program Office. The Joint Program Office served its purpose during initial development and systems development and demonstration for the F-35. But the purpose of the JPO was to arbitrate among the various stakeholders to maintain as much commonality as possible in the aircraft. Today, the service variants and the partner variants have very little in common with each other. And as the jets are fielding with the partners and their FMS customers and our services, the needs of those entities will only continue to diverge. So it's time for the US services to take ownership of their respective variants. Slide. So you now might think that we're F-35 zealots. The bottom line is we're not. We simply believe that to mitigate risk across the next decade, that the fighters that are, the fifth generation fighters that are currently in production, the F-35 is the best choice the Air Force has to buy capability and capacity now. That said, the F-35 was also designed 20 years ago. And NGAD should not be the only fighter that the Air Force has in the future. 
you know, we expect that NGAD may be a more expensive platform and may not be procured at the high rates or add to the capacities that we might want. So General Brown, the Air Force, they are actually right in wanting to start a new affordable fighter design and to do so in this decade. What we disagree with is the notion that this new fighter should be non-stealthy, a 4.5 or fifth gen minus. It simply does not make sense to go backwards in capability. There are better ways to achieve affordability, and we agree that affordability, both in procurement and in operational costs, is an important consideration. And there are precedents, like the F-16 and F-117 that exist, to show us how we can model that program in a way that achieves significantly advanced capability and do so in a way that's focused, fast, in a common sense way, and make sure that affordability is on our side. Slide. Now, it's no secret that Mitchell harbors no love for the F-15EX, primarily because it's a high cost, technologically irrelevant platform that would lead to a tiered force and a valuable fighter capacity that wouldn't be useful in a contested battle space. With procurement costs a little bit more than F-35, it still doesn't make any sense to go backward in capability when there's a better option. I know we've all heard that fifth gen makes fourth gen better, but the converse is also true that fourth gen makes fifth gen worse. And while some in the Air Force has tossed out the notion that EX could be a truck for outsized extended range weapons, standing outside threat rings, in many ways negates the increased range of these new generations of weapons. So with constrained resources, the F-15 EX is not the most prudent path forward, especially because it comes as a lost opportunity. Instead, we should take the funding that's going into the EX program now buy more F-35s and fund an alternative fighter. Slide. This slide is a graph of the service budgets for the last 30 years. Note that that dark blue is the Air Force top line budget. And the light blue line is what the service calls its blue budget, Air Force blue. This blue budget takes pass through out. Pass through, as you know, are funds that are in the Air Force budget but the Air Force has no access to, no control over, and does not fund core Air Force capabilities. Instead, that pass-through funding moves through the Air Force budget and goes to other government agencies. So once you take that pass-through out and you get to that Air Force blue, you can see that in general, the Department of the Air Force, this now includes the Space Force, is the least resourced of all the services. Now, we're not under the illusion that taking pass through out of the Air Force's budget means the Air Force would suddenly get that money back, but it would facilitate a much more transparent and honest conversation about resourcing, about priorities, and about the risk that the department is willing to take and assuming over the course of the next decade. I also think that it's important to note that over the past 30 years, the, the three decades that have put the Air Force in this position, if you take a look at how much that pass-through has summed up to, pass-through funds total nearly a trillion dollars from 1991 to FY21. Slide. So it's a long paper. We've done a lot of analysis. In general, we think the Air Force has mostly the right vector. With some small changes, they can make real impact in addressing and mitigating the risk over the course of the next decade and really building towards the future force that they need. Slide. Joan Datula, thank you. Back to you. Well, thanks very much for that uh, overview, Heather. Um, that's a, a, an excellent job given all of the, the topics that you cover in the paper. Uh, and I encourage everyone uh, to take a look at the paper uh, because it has a, a lot more logic and uh, that uh, Heather just gave you a, a, a taste of on the various recommendations. Uh, but what I'd like to do now is uh, go to our uh, distinguished uh, panelist. Uh, the first one is uh, General Lowe, who has uh, uh, been around for uh, many years watching uh, uh, travails of the Air Force uh, and the challenges that it's faced. And so with that, I'd like to thank you again for being here, sir and I give you the opportunity to give us a couple of your perspectives on this topic. Okay, Dave, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Heather, for an excellent uh, presentation. I agree with just about 99% of what Heather said and the conclusion she reached. Let me add a couple of observations based on my 
my activity in this whole business of uh, modernization, force structure, fighting wars. Uh, I like your take on planning force versus program force. But in order to get to the planning force, you've got to do some thinking. And the way we did thinking back in Air Combat Command was, you know, we, we, we developed a force sizing methodology. And I haven't seen a force sizing methodology yet in the Air Force these days. Uh, the force sizing methodology considered the threat and, uh, and the scenarios, uh, focused on the scenario. The scenarios you have now are based basically on the, in the Pacific and against China and some Russia and some other contingencies. But you lay out that threat and then you figure out how many fighter airplanes or bombers or tankers or airlifters, how many, how many fighter airplanes you need to, to handle the threat. Not the worst case threat, which I see all over, but the most probable threat. And not to paint the threat as 10 feet tall, but maybe eight and a half feet tall, because he's going to suffer some attrition. So, so base your needs for how many fighters you need on a, on a most probable threat scenario and several of them. Now we did that in the past, and that's how we came up with so many fighter wings that are needed of different types. The second part of that force structure methodology is what are the what are the features of these of each aircraft that you put into this mix in order to, for them to get to the fight, fight and survive. So now when I look at where you are today, uh, in every case, the needs exceed the budget. The planning force, the force structure methodology that you use, would use, is going to be higher than what you can afford. That's fair. That's always been the case, always. But you always, we always had that planning force, that requirement out there, that force structure requirement in terms of quantity and quality. And, and we never lost sight of that. And we advocated it every day and every week. And it was real because we, we could defend it. The numbers I see today, 1763, 1550 per fighter. I don't know how the Air Force defends that because I haven't seen any methodology behind it that comes up with the number 1763. 386 squadrons was good. I think there were seven fighter squadron, additional fighter squadrons in that, but it, it has to be more extensive than that. So what I see today and when I look at budgets is the Air Force is settling for 72 fighters a year. I've seen that, I've heard that, but the problem is it's not 72 fifth generation fighters, it's 48 fifth generation fighters and, and uh, 24 fourth generation fighters, F-15s. And, uh, and, and I don't think that's gonna win the battle. So I think I agree with Heather that you need to, you need to increase the annual production rate of fighters and they all need to be and they all need to be at 35. They all need to be stealthy because now fighters have to operate in contested airspace. Contested airspace is the new normal. It's the normal. Contested airspace is the normal. And if you can't operate in contested airspace, uh, you probably shouldn't be there. And stealth, stealth is a prerequisite for operating in a contested airspace. So that's logical. That's pretty sensible. You have to operate in contested airspace, which is getting tougher and tougher every year. And the airplanes that are operating in contested airspace have to be stealthy. Okay, if you agree with that, then the F-15E doesn't have a place in your future inventory. And therefore we should be buying as many F-35s as we can, as we can each year. I've heard the justification for the F-15EX adding capacity. My gosh, you've got huge capacity in, in the bomber force. And in fact, I don't think you should get rid of the B-1s uh, for conventional operations because you can keep the B1s cheaper and you can buy a whole bunch of F-15s and still have tremendous capacity and standoff, which the F-15 is going to require to, uh, to plunk a couple of uh, long range. So anyway, uh, so the, uh, the one more point, the F, so we ought to be buying the F-35 at a higher rate, you know, so press, well, I would press for that. And, and I'd offer the, the, the business of curtailing production to wait for the next hot technology biscuit doesn't make sense to me. I mean, once you get into high rate production of a fighter, keep it on high rate production. That's called return on investment. Don't curtail production waiting for the next hot biscuit. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. We can produce F-35s at 96 a year, 72, 96 a year. The older ones we siphon off into less demanding missions like, like Homeland Defense where all the capabilities aren't required. But, but you keep building them and making them. Those earlier F-35s are capable in contested environments. They may not have the full capability, but they're capable. This business of waiting for the next hot biscuit is, that never works. It never works. You never get there from here. 
The example I use is our F-16. F I, I spent six decades in the F-16 program. And we were producing F-16s at 144 a year. We had two five-year multi-rate multi contracts for each one. And that did maximize return on investment. And we didn't slow down production in order to wait for block 40, block 50, block 60. We kept producing and when block 40 was ready, we put it in. When block 50 was ready, we put it in. When block 60 technology and systems were ready, we put it in. But we certainly didn't slow down production in order to wait for new technology, which I guess that's an outgrowth of the Roper theme that you ought to buy a new fighter every five years and produce just a few dozen. That doesn't make any sense at all. My, my recommendation, buy the F-35, buy them in quantity, buy them at high rate as you can, and don't wait and don't curtail production in order to wait for the next hot biscuit. That's it. That's my time, David. Over to the next guy. Well, thanks very much, General Lowe. I uh, appreciate the, your perspectives uh, and, uh, and wisdom. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to uh, John Venable, but before um, I do that, I just want to highlight the fact that uh, JV was uh, the individual who had a big hand. I mean, he was the one who orchestrated the Air Force piece of the Heritage Foundation recent uh, uh, defense index for uh, 2022. Uh, and I hope, uh, JV, you, you touch upon some of the rationale um, for why the rating or assessment of the Air Force went from marginal um, uh, to weak. Uh, and by the way, for the audience, if you haven't seen it, there's a great op-ed uh, on how to revive the Air Force out of its weak state. Uh, and that's in the uh, AFA's daily report this morning. So JV, over to you. General Tula, thank you. And I highly commend that report and the one that uh, Heather wrote. Thank you, Heather, for the opportunity and the Mitchell Institute for bringing me on today. And it's hard to follow General Lowe. I'm not sure how he got better looking and younger looking over the years, but he has. So uh, grateful for that. So uh, the Heritage Foundation does an index of military strength every year. And and uh, as, as uh, General Deptula mentioned, my job is to go through the Air Force side. We basically divide um, the ability for us to project power into capacity, capability, and readiness. And we score each of those areas. And as I look at the Air Force side, we use a two MRC, major regional conflict construct, uh, in order to determine capacity. Many people will argue this, but I will tell you, it will take more than two MRCs worth of capacity to execute a war uh, successfully against a peer com uh, competitor. And what we've got right now is marginal capacity to handle two MRCs. Um, if you look at how we did it, I'll go into those uh, means if we need to, but basically an MRC takes 600 fighters worth of, uh, of capacity. Two MRCs makes that 1,200, and that's combat capable fighters, not trainers, not test uh, and evaluation aircraft. And, and this year, as we went through the process, looked at the Air Force, uh, II, AA, and a couple of others, we came up with 983 combat coded fighters that are ready to go. Um, uh, and while that's, that's a hefty number, that's not enough to, to actually project forward, particularly when you look at the capabilities of those fighters and the readiness of the fighter force. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, Heather touched on and uh, General Deptula touched on, our numbers are actually going to go down again over the next 10 years. And that 983 figure, which we rate as marginal capacity, um, will actually continue to drop over the next five to, to 10 years unless something changes. Uh, capability wise, we actually look at what each of those aircraft, fighters, bombers, uh, tankers, uh, and airlift uh, platforms bring to the fight. And, and we look at how ready, uh, uh, actually how capable those are. And if you look at the F-35 right now, it can go anywhere and do anything we need it to do. The fourth generation fighters um, are actually not capable of going into Kaliningrad, in, into the mouth of a Chinese threat. And actually a fourth generation pl platform needs a, an escort of a fifth generation bird along with it in order to go over Syria right now because of the elevated threat uh, that's in that low threat environment, what we would consider that. So uh, as far as our modernization programs go, uh, the F-35 modernization program is incredible. If you go and look at how it was developed, it's all open, open kimono. There's no hidden uh, uh, upgrades or modernization of that jet. It's all built into the spiral up 
into the block four, block three, going to block four um, uh, capability. And so if you look at that, it's a, it's a very capable, very uh, robust, but that expense is also starting to, to weather at it. And, and Congress has put some things into this latest version of the NDAA, which is gonna cap that. And we can talk about that later. How we're executing that modernization program is something that Heather and General Deptula talk, talked about as well as General Lowe. And we're actually taking an incredibly capable fighter and we're minimizing its, its acquisition and then buying a, a fighter which will not be capable of going into that next conflict, which uh, again, this brings our, our uh, capability, the, the fighters that we, are, we have on board and those that we are acquiring down to a marginal level. level. And finally, we'll talk about readiness. And we took our readiness score from, from marginal last year uh, down to weak this year, and it's very weak. Uh, with regard to our readiness, our ability to generate lines and actually go out and execute uh, the margins that we have. If you go back into the 1980s, how we built our fighter force, uh, we basically knew that we had better technology and we spun up our pilots, uh, our, our combat uh, capable aircrew to a level that was dominant in the world. At that time, um, Soviet fighters were getting between 80 and, I'm sorry, eight, uh, 90 and 130 hours a year of flying time on average. Uh, last year, the uh, Air Force actually with COVID, we dipped down below that 130 level for the average fighter pilot. And so now that edge that we had with regard to the capability of our pilots going out and training on a daily basis has dropped significantly. While that you could give that excuse to COVID, it had been dropping for years. When the Trump administration came in and, and spun up its, uh, its budget to, for the Air Force, we actually threw a lot of money at O&M. How that money was used and how it translated into flight hours wasn't as beneficial as it should have been. I think we increased overall O&M spending from 2017 to 2020 by about um, uh, 15%, but that only elevated our, our um, flight hours, as it translates directly, by about eight to 9%, which is, which is again, something is wrong organizationally or in a leadership capacity that we're not moving that ball forward faster. Unfortunately, we're taking that construct that started to rebuild readiness and we started reducing it last year accidentally through COVID, but now the Air Force is gonna cut uh, flying hours, I believe by eight to 10% the funding associated by, for the coming year. Um, and that, again, sends a signal um, down that says that we're not actually wanting to go in a different direction than we are. And so you take it all together, our readiness, uh, our capacity and our capability with a readiness score dropping um, into uh, the, the weak category, that brought us down overall to a weak level. Uh, if I could pile on to what General Lowe, General Deptula and uh, Heather said earlier, we need to be moving on the F-35 as rapidly as we can, because when the balloon goes up, we won't have that capability to increase that production line to, the, to nearly the capacity that the leadership in, in both DOD and within the Air Force believes that we can because of the limitations on our industrial base. And I'll stop there, General Diptula. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Well, thanks very much for those comments, uh, uh, JV. And th there's so much uh, to discuss. Um, uh, normally, at this point, um, uh, I would, uh, and, and I've got a couple questions for all of you, um, but I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for audience questions. So what we're going to do now is uh, open the session to questions from the audience who've been uh, listening to the conversation. Uh, and uh, feel free to direct your question to one or more of the, uh, uh, of the panelists. Um, and we have some distinguished listeners with us today. Uh, the first one I'm going to call on is a former uh, chief of staff uh, and, and someone who's been involved in uh, these deliberations for many, many years, uh, General John Jumper. So General Jumper, thanks for being with us today. And over to you for your comments and questions. Thanks, Dave. And uh, great work, Heather. Uh, this is a, a masterful uh, piece of work, I think. Uh, it's long overdue, and I think uh, 
uh, your analysis is, is right on. Like General Lowe, I agree uh, with what you said. Also, uh, thank you, General Lowe, for uh, reminding us of the path you took through the F-16 program, which I still think is the model program. Uh, I believe you had a, uh, a hand in uh, building uh, what was then called the JAST program, which uh, would have been a program that kept us uh, going in uh, fighter technology over time. Uh, that was, uh, uh, of course, uh, di didn't, uh, didn't uh, last as it should have. Uh, Dave, just a couple of comments and... Uh, um, uh, you know, we've been through, we've been here before. I mean, we've heard buzzwords like uh, uh, transformational. Uh, 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 we've we've um, heard uh, these uh, these budget tricks and these uh, bumper stickers that uh, serve as uh, policy guidelines that just flat don't work. Um, uh, you. You're now faced with a situation globally where we are facing, uh, of course, not only what the fighters have to face, but we're now back into full, full spectrum warfare where we have to deal with not only the high end, which uh, we're rightfully emphasizing here, but also continue to deal with the low end with Air Force assets. Thus, General Lowe's comment about the importance of the B-1 and, uh, and things that uh, can continue to operate in uncontested airspace the way they have been uh, so successfully. Um, and I uh, also General's, uh, General Lowe's comment about math, uh, methodology, I use the word CONOPS. Dave, you and I have had many uh, conversations about this, but CONOPS allows you to actually take a warfighter's view of how you're going to execute. And not only just by yourself, but in the joint world as well. And when you do joint CONOPS, it tends to emphasize and point out the fact that Air Force air power is unique in what it delivers to the joint force commander, uh, uh, minus the... Uh, specific uh, employment of, uh, of other forms of, of air power. I'd also uh, uh, go back with General Lowe to our time with General Bill Creech. As we uh, increased uh, readiness rates uh, dramatically, the first thing we did is go out and buy spare parts and put emphasis on maintenance. And we made maintenance a major part of the Air Force organization and the Air Force uh, uh, dialogue. And uh, that's what got us to 90% MC rates when we went into uh, to Desert Storms. Dave, you were able to take advantage of that uh, in your in your position there, um, and then uh, JV, you bring up uh, you know the other aspects of it. I just emphasize training. The uh, the edge that we have right now continues to be in training as our technological edge uh, starts to erode. And if we don't get the flying hours, we don't get the training. And I think a part of what you're emphasizing here should include a dialogue about uh, spares parts and sustainability, and a dialogue about the importance of uh, of advanced training and how important an edge that is uh, to us. And then I guess uh, for uh, Heather and for Dave, uh, have we been able to get this uh, briefing in front of the chief of staff or is there plans to? And uh, can we join forces with the studies and analysis world in the Pentagon uh, to put some actual flesh out, some con ops and actually take this to the next level? Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to come in. Well, thanks again, uh, John Jumper, uh, for those uh... Uh, additions and in, 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 in issues that are obviously of significant concern. A real quick answer to your questions at the, at the end. Um, no, we haven't put this in front of uh, the Air Force leadership at this time, since this is the initial, uh, initial rollout. Um, we look forward uh, uh, to doing that. Uh, uh, because again, we're not, we're, what we're trying to do is to raise a variety of different ideas um, uh, to assist the Air Force move forward, given the extraordinarily uh, challenging fiscal environment that it faces. Heather, Heather anything to add? Uh, no, sir. I, I think um, what you said fully covers uh, what General Jumper had asked about. But we look forward to uh, being able to partner with the Air Force to be able to advocate, uh, you know, and, and help educate the public on what the Air Force needs to be able to uh, execute its responsibilities to the NDF. Uh, General Lowe, uh, JV, comments on uh, General, General Jumper's uh, uh, insights? Uh, General, General Lowe, you're on mute. How about now? It's good. Well, I'd just like to commend my good friend, John Jumper, for being on, uh, on, on the call and the comments that he had are right on target. He mentioned General Creech's name. I'd just like to point out a short anecdote. 
I first met General Jumper when he was, I met Major Jumper, I guess. He was the executor aide to uh, General Creech at Langley a long, long time ago. And of course he moved all the way up, but you notice today there is a Creech Air Force Base, used to be Indian Springs. And there's one man that's responsible for Indian Springs becoming Creech Air Force Base and that's General John Jumper. Well done, John, thank you. Yes, sir, if I could pile on, uh, love the uh, General Jumper's remarks and the, the side about readiness uh, that is really untested right now is our ability to get up and go. So when you think about mobilization and moving um, what we need into a combat area rapidly, um, that used to be tested on a regular basis by an uh, operational readiness evaluation team. Right now, there is nothing of the sort that's actually going in and doing that on a regular basis. And, and we need to actually push those buttons forward, uh, in, in my humble opinion, to where units actually are under the gun uh, and under the clock to mobilize and then be able to employ in a rapid basis. The, the wing commanders that have tried this on their own in the Pacific and other areas have found it quite fascinatingly hard uh, to do that, to actually move from a non-employment environment in, into one where they would. And so this is something I believe that needs to be integrated in this as well. Readiness is a big deal. And right now we don't really know where we are. Go ahead, Heather. Uh, so, yeah, sir, I'd like to, to jump on to what JV had mentioned regarding readiness and training, what General Jumper had mentioned regarding training. As we move into a global world where we have technological uh, proliferation and we're facing technological peers, right? I mean, we do not have a patent on, on innovation and ingenuity within the US. And if we don't have the ability to move faster and field faster than our adversaries and our competitors, what we have to rely upon is our training. How robust our training is, how skilled and proficient and current uh, our war fighters are, and then also on our tactics as well. So I think we cannot, we, we have to remember the importance of the training readiness uh, when we're facing and, and moving into this wor new world of technological peers. Okay, well, thanks very much. Let's uh, uh, turn now to uh, Brian uh, Everstein. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks everyone for doing this. I was hoping to drive down into one of the recommendations in the report, specifically about extending the F-22 to go into NGAD and the need for some modernization there. What, what modernization is there do you see to keep that fleet viable and effective beyond 2030? Now, obviously the F-22 is incredibly effective, but it's one of the lower MC rates and one of the most expensive fleets in the Air Force. What mod, uh, what funding repriority is needed to get to that end? Thank you. Brian, you're right. The F-22 is one of the most expensive fleets in the Air Force, and that's primarily because Secretary Gates curtailed it at a, a, a just an irrationally small number. Um, so it, it suffers all the problems that small fleets have. I mean, for one, we've never been able to replace the early jets that are uh, at the training units. And so we've had to upload uh, training into operational units and that decreases their readiness. So there's so many problems that, that were consequences of that very early and fateful decision um, to, to prematurely cancel and terminate uh, the F-22 production. So what we need to do is be committed to the hard stuff of addressing diminishing manufacturing resources, uh, developing and being willing to modernize and retrofit um, maintainability elements of it. So the F-22 did go through a ramp program where they were very focused on addressing some of the maintainability pieces. We will likely need to do something like that again. And we will need to look at how do we um, take those earlier jets, not only do a service life extension program on the entire fleet, but how do we begin to converge configurations and do think the, the difficult expensive, unfortunately, but necessary, absolutely necessary elements um, to make sure that that aircraft not only is uh, operationally and technologically relevant in the 2030s, but from a structural and processing um, standpoint, uh, able to continue into the 2030s. So it's not an easy endeavor, but it will be absolutely crucially important because of those early decisions by Secretary Gates to cancel the program. Thanks, and if I could just follow up with the separate question obviously so much of this focus is on the high end 
um, other than a retirement of the A10, I didn't see that much focus on the low end. Do you see a need for programs like say armed overwatch to continue? So we did focus much on the high end because that's the existential problem set, right? Um, so when we, one of our recommendations is to continue to uh, the F-16s. So rather than divesting F-16, that's the legacy fleet that we put our money on, not only because um, it, it's proven to be a highly capable multi-role fighter, but is the most reliable of the legacy aircraft. Um, and it's got the most life left. And it's also the least expensive to be able to operate. So in terms of, of capability, cost effectiveness, um, and really cost per effect, and capacity, both in numbers within the fleet, but then also the enterprise capacity, we see the F-16 as being the most relevant for those low-end type of uncontested um, environments. Hey, Brian, this is General Deftula. Let me also add, don't forget those uh, hundreds of uh, uh, uninhabited uh, MQ-9s that we have in the force. Uh, that uh, also can provide uh, extended uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and a small amount of strike. Um, so that's the other piece I would uh, add to uh, Heather's response to your question. And I'll second General Deptula on that. When we look at mission demand, we need to also be looking at what are the right capabilities and, and the remotely piloted fleet in the MQ-9 is mo the most relevant to that sort of persistent armed overwatch that you mentioned. Okay, we've got a question from Mr. Edward uh, Taylor. Ed, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I'm a um, retired Air Force um, from a long time ago. Uh, worked with Paul Kaminsky through the late 70s and 80s and early 90s. And I just wanted to make a comment. I'm spending my time now at um, Lincoln Lab and Raytheon modeling the Pacific War. And there may be room to move to move back to some special purpose fighters. We got into the general purpose fighter in the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s, but I was involved in the early days of the 117. And we've got some big problems like keeping the Russian bombers out of the Arctic and keeping Chinese bombers away from Guam, where you need faster and longer range fighters. You don't need a lot of them, but if you could hold their bombers at risk and their standoff at risk, it might do some things for you. And there's a couple other special purpose missions where it might be relevant to get smaller numbers of very capable um, aircraft back. And I, you know, we've had this in the past, not to drag on forever, but F-14s and Phoenix was a very important capability in keeping standoff away from our forces and uh, so on. So as you go forward with this plan, I think there might be some room for adding some of that back in. Hey, Ed, um, thanks very much for those uh, inputs. And I think what you described almost to a T is um, the, the expectations and why NGAD, uh, the next generation air dominance fighter is being developed. Um, it, it, it's, you essentially described the rationale um, for why the Air Force is uh, headed toward that, uh, uh, toward yeah, that type. So, yeah, so I'm involved in that too. But I, th I personally think there is room for a Mach 3 plus fighter. I think we, and, and I don't think you're gonna, I don't think you're gonna buy that in quantity with, but I think there's also room for a next generation air dominance that can go mix it up and, and fight uh, three to one, five to one, the kind of fighter war that we used to have in Europe. You're gonna get that in the Western Pacific. You're gonna be, you're gonna be fighting outnumbered and you're gonna need but you but you don't need Mach 3.5. I'm just I'm just arguing we can't we can't homogenize. And anyway, I'll I'll. Now, I, it, it's a wonderful point, but here's what the Air Force is going to tell you: love to do it. Where's the money? I, I mean, as as Heather yeah. mentioned in her report, I mean, we've got F-35, we've got KC-46, we've got B-21, we've got GBSD, which is the Minuteman three replacement. We've got a helicopter. We've got T seven. We've got AVMS. We've got jet. 
Where is the upgrade. money going to come from? Yeah. All right. So you're back to budget now. I'm after planning, right? Yeah. And right. So there, are, you know, these are essential capabilities. You can decide to do them. You can decide to pay for them. You can, et cetera. I just think if we're in the business of saying, what is it going to take to win? We ought to put, all, put on the table the stuff it's going to take to win. And then you take the risk. Yes, you sir. Wanna, you're, you don't want to yeah. go intercept bombers. Don't do it. But F-16s don't intercept bombers up over Canada. Yep. No, you're exactly right. And, and this is why some of us believe very strongly uh, that that one trillion dollars additional that was given to the army over the last 20 years, we need that kind of balance to recapitalize and to make the Air Force well again. Uh, and so that budget shift needs to occur and it needs to occur fast. Um, and, you know, no more go along to get along. Uh, little League rules. Uh, everyone gets a fair share of the budget. Um, All that. It, yeah, we can't. We can't. Anyway, I think your first step, figure out what it's going to take to win. And then and then people can do the cost and the risk. And yeah, Army in the Pacific, hard for me to understand it. Right. Uh, the war is going to be over in two weeks, et cetera. So anyway, I'll stop there. OK, thank you, Ed. Um, we've got a, several questions uh, uh, on uh, the chat log. Now, I normally don't answer or ask questions from anonymous attendees. But I want to make sure that all parts of the uh, uh, fighter equation get uh, evidence. So here's one that I throw out, uh, Heather and, and JV and General Lowe. Um, the F-35's combat radius is not optimized for operations in the Indo-PACOM theater or the Arctic Global Commons. It's also difficult to maintain its low observable capabilities with limited crews. Isn't there a need for a multi-role platform like the F-15EX for operations like this or other future fights against non-peer adversaries? Heather, you want to take that one on? Yeah, I'll jump into this one first. Um, first of all, if you think that the F-35 has limitations, why would you think the F-15EX would be any more survivable or any more um, operationally successful and relevant, right? Um, we should not be abdicating our ability to be able to operate from within the threat radius. We didn't abdicate it uh, during the Cold War. And I don't know why we're so willing to move ourselves backwards because every time we stand back and stand off, China's gonna stand in, right? The reason why we have tankers is so that we can extend our global power. So that's, you know, that's my response to the combat radius. Uh, we need to continue to focus on tankers. We need to continue to focus on how do we continue to push that capability forward. Um, but also, again, you would be surprised at how far low observability comes in terms of the, the skin and the materials. This is not your granddaddy's F-117 low observabilities. Uh, and of course, so much of that low observability comes from the shaping, not simply just the materials. So that's a fallacy that we need to begin to debunk because it's a crucially important piece of better is no kidding better than past technologies. And so that, that would be my response. JV, what else do you have to add? General Deptula, if I could jump in there, I completely agree with what Heather said. This uh, range idea that the, the F-15EX can outrange it to a significant level, the F-35, that's not true. Um, and the F-35 has never had those external wing tanks put on it where you can drop those and go forward. There's so many different things that have yet to be developed with this airplane and added on, and that's being looked at right now. Um, the maintainability, you used to fly and you still fly a B-2 through a rainstorm, and that airplane's going to be grounded for a while because of the stealth coating on it and the repairs associated with it. You can literally stand on an F-35 and scuff your heel into it, any heel, and it will not damage uh, the skin at all. It is not the same. The last thing I'll throw out is this approach idea that uh, in an all-out war with China, and no one wants to talk about that, but in an all-out war with China, would it just be an east to west approach from, uh, from the allies, or would we look, be looking from a southwest to northeast um, complication for this, meaning land based out of uh, out of India or uh, another uh, country in that that regime. These are things that you have to think through. And and for me, 
Um, if you're looking at actually being able to fly an airplane like the F-15EX into one of those areas because of its range, then you have to know that it will never survive in order to employ in that in environment. Those are knowns. These are things that uh, you need to go in and look at it. I would also look at and tip, tip every other aspect of this. The cost of acquisition is significantly lower for the F-35, like 30% below what an uh, F-15EX costs. And the sustainability, flight hours, annual, uh, the cost tab for these airplanes to operate is about a parity right now and the F-35 is coming down. On any front, it does not make sense to buy a more expensive, less capable airplane than the F-35. It makes no sense. You know, JV, I, this will sound a little bit glib, but when we're talking about range of the F-15EX, we also need to be talking about range of the rescue helicopter. <laughs> oh, what, good, what a great point. Okay, well, on that note, um, everybody, we've uh, come to the end of uh, our rollout of our research report. Uh, again, uh, titled The Future Fighter Force Our Nation Requires Building a Bridge. Um, I would direct all of you to our website uh, uh, to read the latest uh, copy and uh, uh, eh, otherwise, send me an email and I'll send you a copy. Uh, but what I'd like to do at this time is give a great big thanks to uh, Heather Penny, to General Lowe, and uh, John Venable. Uh, thanks very much for sharing your insights uh, on these issues. And from all of us here at Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day. Thank you. Thank you.